Hello again and welcome to WCTV's newest show, The Waynesburg Effect. I'm Ryan Schwertfeger and joining us as always is Paige Carter, good to see you again, and Mr. Adam Karasik, looking dapper as usual. So the way this show works is that each panelist will bring up a current event topic that has an effect on the community, us as college students, or even all of us as Americans. Each panelist will get an opportunity to give their opinion on the issue at hand, and we may even engage in a friendly debate on the topic. Now, while all of us have our own opinions, we also do our best to ensure that what we say is backed up with facts so that you, the viewer, can not only be more informed, but also capable to form your own opinions on how the topic we discuss affects you. This is the Waynesburg Effect. Welcome back to the Waynesburg Effect. Starting us off today on a topic about minimum wage is Ms. Paige Carter. Thanks, Ryan. Nebraska has raised their minimum wage, and as other states follow suit, questions about minimum wage increase arise. What jobs usually are minimum wage earners for? Will increasing wages create more jobs? What was the original intent of minimum wage, and what are the disadvantages to this decision? Adam. Recently, um, policymakers are proposing to raise minimum wage. It's very trendy right now, but it's also showing some harmful repercussions. Um, some major ones, it would result in job loss. It would hurt low-skilled workers because companies would become more picky as to um, who they're hiring. Um, it would have little effect on reducing poverty, and it may result in higher prices for consumers. And I know that's a lot, and I know there's some pretty major topics. But I'm ask, I want to ask you, Adam, do you think there are any beneficial um, advantages to raising minimum wage statewide? Um, well, the, the only thing I could gather, and uh, I have this from the article from the Washington Post, that um, uh, there would be like 900,000 people uh, out of poverty if we were to raise the minimum wage, uh, but there are still 44 million people that are going to still be left in poverty. So with like without having at least one million helped, it doesn't really do a lot. It's basic ec economics, really. If you raise the minimum wage, everything else is just going to have to balance that out, yeah. and you're going to have to get to uh, everything else being more expensive, so then we're just back at square one. So it, at the time it helps, but it's also gonna be hard for people to get those low paying jobs at like McDonald's or, or like summer jobs. And it's gonna be harder for on teenagers, like us co college students that need jobs. Uh, it will affect a lot of that because you're paying people more. If you're paying someone $10.10 uh, $10 per hour instead of seven twenty five like now, that's a little bit more money. And yeah. if you don't have that, like you normally do, and it, if it just changes, it's not going to do a lot of good. So I don't think there is any really big positives here with this decision. Yeah, especially with um, privately owned companies. They don't have the money to pay that. Um, but Ryan, try kind of switching gears here, with the recent ele election, four conservative states voted um, in support of minimum wage, uh, the states being Nebraska, South Dakota, Alaska, and Arkansas. What do you think about this um, and how it will affect other states and the trends that will follow. And do you think this is a state or federal issue? Should, should we be voting on this in um, elections that are not primary or um, should the government just kind of make a mandate on that? Well, do, I guess I'll answer your second question first. Uh, I do believe this is a state issue. It's not a federal issue. The federal government has made it an issue because it's something that most people, you could say, would support. Because uh, it's, it's something that's you know, very favorably looked upon by people who maybe who don't own business and are just getting the paycheck. But for the people who are running the businesses, they're the ones who are the main driving forces to say, no, we don't want to see an increase because that means more money that's coming out of their pockets, which might mean that you know, other things are going to have to be cut or they can't hire new employees. Um, but going off of the, the states that did vote to raise it, I think it, the reason why this should be a state issue, not a federal issue, is it really depends on the economy in that state. Uh, I can tell you that I'm from New Jersey, and it's one of the most expensive states in the nation uh, to you know buy groceries or get. I mean, gas actually is a little bit cheaper, but <laughs> a, a lot of other things, especially you know, property taxes, income taxes, it is one of the most ridiculously high tax state 
in the country. And I think, you know, with the minimum wage is pretty low, most people cannot afford that. Uh, so I think, uh, depending on the state that you're in, you should examine, you know, how much does it actually cost to reasonably live in that state? And the minimum wage should then be based off of that. Uh, I think just to have a federal mandate and say everyone should follow this number, you know, it, things are probably going to be maybe cheaper in Alaska or, um, you know, like South Dakota rather than in California, New York, or New Jersey. So I think if, if it was a state-by-state -state issue, then the states that can afford or should have it a little bit higher, which would help their citizens more, then they, they can vote to raise it there. But in terms of the federal mandate across the board, I think it's just very ill-advised. What is the minimum wage in New Jersey? I believe we just raised it to 825. Um, they just, they're actually on the ballot, I believe it was last year. Uh, it's now going to be adjusted with the consumer price index. Okay. So from now on, it's, just gonna, it's gonna reflect that going up. Uh, but it was something that Governor Christie did not want to sign. And he said, I think it should be something that's put to the voters and the voters approved it. And like we're seeing in all these other Republican states, when it goes to the main voters, they usually vote yes on issues like this. Um, and I think that's the way, I mean, we can agree to disagree about should it be raised, should it not be raised, but I think it needs to be something that is decided at the state level for what can benefit those residents the most. Adam, he just said he thinks it's a state issue that should be voted upon. Do you think that citizens are, are well enough informed to actually vote on this issue? Because my, my natural thought is that people just want more money. So if it's on the table that we want to give minimum wage workers more money, more times than not, they're just going to say, okay, even if they, they're not thinking about the consumer price index, they're not thinking about taxes. So do you think that, um, do you agree with Ryan in the sense that it should be a state issue that's voted on? Uh, I, I, I can see where that would be the idea of what to do. But I, I also think that, yes, it doesn't seem like a lot of people know that once you do raise this, and people always do want more money, um, it's going to be harder on a lot of, there are a lot of elements in there that people don't realize, like the fact that it will shift to everything else costing a lot more and it just will be back to square one. And we'll also end up having a lot of people um, not being able to get jobs like teenagers and, uh, and it's gonna be a lot harder, a lot longer process to get a job at like McDonald's or Starbucks or or easy minimum wage jobs like that. So it's going to be a lot tougher and I don't think a lot of people realize that in the long run it's not gonna be any different or any better for the country. Yeah, I think it's some, an issue that needs to be educated. People need to be educated on what it means so that we aren't just being selfish, which is the natural inclination. Coming up after the break, we will take a look at the midterm elections and what it means for our country. Stay tuned. Coming home can be hard if you're a veteran of Iraq or Afghanistan. You may feel like you're all alone. But you're not alone. At IAVA.org, your fellow vets are all around you. free online community, get the resources you need, and connect to other vets who know where you're coming from. IAVA.org, we've got your back. After weeks, months, and even years of hype and buildup, the 2014 midterm elections are now over. For the most part, with the exception of Louisiana, as that race is going to a runoff election this December. But voters across the country voted for who would represent them in the House of Representatives, the U.S. State, and the U.S. Senate, and in some states in their governor's offices. Now, while Democrats were able to gain a governor's seat here in Pennsylvania with Tom Wolf beating the incumbent Republican governor, Tom Corbett, and retaining several Senate seats across the nation, the Republican Party were the huge victors a uh, few days ago as they took the majority in the U.S. Senate and even won many close governor's races in states not typical for the GOP to do well in, which includes Maryland, Illinois, and others. Now we're going to show you a quick clip of Michelle Bachman, a current Republican congresswoman in Minnesota, and she was speaking to CNN about Obama's response to the midterm election. 
The real question is, did the president listen to what happened on Tuesday night? And if you listen to his press conference, he didn't. It's almost like he had his hands over his ears and he said, I'm going to continue my, my agenda. I'm going to continue to fundamentally transform the United States of America. The American people said no. They weighed in. The election had consequences. The president needs to take a measure of that result and listen to the will of the people. It's not about him. It's about the people. So a lot of people have been saying that President Obama has circumvented Congress at almost any step necessary. So Paige, do you think that now that President Obama has no choice but to work with Congress, do you think he's going to try and take a lot of steps unilaterally? Or is he going to actually work with hopefully what will probably will become the, ne the new majority leader, uh, Mitch McConnell, and from the Republicans and among others? I don't think that um, President Obama is going to change much of his ways. Um, in a in an address he did on the outcome of the midterm elections, he said, Congress will pass some bills I cannot sign. I'm pretty sure I will take some actions that some in Congress will not like. That's natural. That's how our democracy works. Um, last time I checked, I'm not sure that's how democracy works because the people talked and they made it clear that they wanted um, Republican incentives going through to Congress. But I, I honestly do think Obama's going to fight as hard as he can to get his um, agendas pushed through, especially immigration. I really don't think there's much the GOP is going to be able to do with that. Um, another quote he said, he said, you send me a bill that I cannot sign, you send me a bill that I can sign, and those executive actions go away. So he's being very clear that he will um, try as hard as he can to do his, what his um, party wants to do, even though the GOP is now the majority in the Senate. So Adam, given what you just heard Paige say, which essentially was is President Obama was not probably going to work with their new Republican Senate majorities in the House and the Senate, um, but essentially almost kind of forcing them to say, put something that I want or that I like on my desk and I'll sign it. Do you, do you, see all, do you agree with that perception? And also, if you uh, wouldn't mind letting us know what your opinions were. Were you surprised by the outcome of the Republicans' victories? Well, I wasn't really surprised. A lot of people, if you talk to them um, t in today's world, uh, when Obama was elected, everyone was happy. Like That was a cool thing, first African-American president. But ever since, it just hasn't seemed to be, uh, like he hasn't been doing a lot and hasn't done a lot of, of good for the country. So a lot of people are more likely to turn to a Republican side just to see if that side can do some, some better for, uh, for our country. But um, going back to the question, I I think it is a good mindset, but it's kind of the mindset that if you don't put anything that he likes, then he's not going to sign it. So if, but if these two, uh, the House and the Senate, uh, are mainly Republican, I think it, it is a, it's a good thing uh, that they can, you know, agree on it instead of like last time when it was mainly two separate things where mm -hmm. you couldn't agree on anything, what nothing was getting done because they're two different viewpoints. So I think. Um, I think it might be a good mindset, but I, I think he needs to open his mind a little bit more. All right. Now, Paige, you had brought up some things about that the Republicans are going to probably come up with some legislation. They're going to be putting it on Obama's desk, and he'll decide whether he wants to sign it or not. Um, but as someone who follows politics, uh, what do you think, if, if you are a Republican in the U.S. Senate and in the U.S. House, what kind of legislation should they be sending to President Obama's desk, and what do you think they will end up sending? So you, maybe like talk a little bit about both, what you think they should be doing and what they probably will end up doing. Well, first of all, I think that how effective it's going to be, I think they're going to try to overturn um, Obamacare once again. I don't think it's going to pass. Is it a waste of time? We can disagree to disagree or formulate our own opinions on that. Um, personally, I think it's a waste of time because Obamacare is not going anywhere. So I do see the Republican Party trying to get that through. Uh, one thing that both Obama and the Republican Party do want to reform in some sense is taxes. So um, I think they could try and potentially be successful in working together uh, from the president and the GOP to get some sort of tax reform. Um, of course, complications arise whenever you decide what you want to reform in the taxes. I know that Republicans really want to focus on corporate taxes, and that's not really a democratic way of thinking. So again, there might be some contention. But I want to see some sort of agenda being pushed through with this GOP coalition. Um, I'm hoping to see true republicanism 
and that will speak in the end, and that's what's going to get through because I think Obama will be more, um, more cooperative if the Republicans come to some type of compromise in, on issues that they feel very strongly against Barack. Because if we're, if it's just this constant power struggle and these constant agendas that are completely contrary to each other, nothing's gonna, going to get done. They're, both sides need to say, I'm going to put away my executive orders and I'm going to put away this agenda and we can meet in the middle and that way we'll see some reforming. So if you don't think that corporate taxes will be something, what do you think that uh, could be reformed? Do you think they'd go to more of a flat tax or like reduce some of the rates? What, what, what kind of compromise do you think would, uh, we, we could actually see? I don't know what you think, but I don't know how, how smart a flat tax federal, nationally would be. But I do see some cuts definitely being able to happen with Obama. Um, and just going off of that, I think with immigration, I really hope the GOP can get a word in with Obama on that because I know he feels very strongly and I do want the GOP to have some opinion on what happens with that but as what it's looking like is what president is going to kind of take the lead on that but um, we'll see what happens it's honestly it's up in the air at this point we were shocked by the results at least I was uh, but I'm excited and I'm hopeful but we'll see what happens within this next year all right, we only have a little bit of time left. I want to get to you quickly, Adam. So Paige kind of talked about you know, what she thinks that they should be doing, but what about the millennial generation? That's kind of the generation that a lot of the politicians are starting to go after now because we're the ones that are starting to go out, vote. We're going to be the next people leading the country. So as a millennial, what do you think that something that they would want to see? What should, what should you know, if millennials could just call up their, all the Republicans and say, you should do this, what, what, what would they be saying? Well, if, if you want to get something done, um, obviously the guy who signs it is the one you want to get to. So I, I think that if you want things to happen in this country, and if these people care what happens in this country, then you need to build, build the bridge between the two parties and put away some of the differences. And I know that the, that's hard to do because they're strong, strongly Republican or Democrat. And, and maybe compromise and think about what's best for, for all of us. That's basically what I mean, that the whole every situation. You just need to put it put away some of the, the differences and talk to each other and say, hey, I know this is how what you think, but what if we did this and we also did some of this? So it, it's just basic bu bridge building. Do you think right. that... Well, I gotta, we, gotta go, we gotta run, Paige, so <laughs> we can always have next time. But coming up next after the break, we're gonna discuss which stories are making the courageous decision to remain closed on Thanksgiving. Stay tuned. A full life measured in seats starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are the number one killer of children 1 through 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. Welcome back to the Waynesburg Effect. As Thanksgiving quickly approaches and we look forward to spending time with our families, we see that some stores are aware of the importance of being with family as well. Many stores such as GameStop and Costco have announced that they will not be open at all during Thanksgiving. However, some establishments will only be open later in the night and others such as Walmart will stay open all Thanksgiving Day, forcing many Americans to miss out on quality time with their families. So uh, the real question here is, um, do you think it's okay that stores stay open on Thanksgiving and keep families from, from being together? Paige, let me start with you. Okay, well, I think just from an empirical sense, it's America, and we can't exactly tell people to spend time with their families. Of course, I, I grew up in a household where Thanksgiving was a great time for family, but that was our personal decision, and I believe that that's still how things should work. There's way too much profit, there's way too much revenue involved in Thanksgiving and Black Friday to say, we're going to we're gonna shut down our store even though we made $17 billion upwards on one day last year. It's just not going to happen. So do I think that it's sad that some people are losing the spirit of Thanksgiving? 
Um, yes, but honestly, ask yourselves, how many people actually know the true story of Thanksgiving? So you can always dig deeper. There's always a greater problem, and it comes down to your intentions and what you want to do in the end. That's how things seem to work these days. So um, personally, I'm not one to get up at 5 a.m. and go to a store to get a toy, but on the flip side of that, if someone else wants to do that, who am I to um, get up, get all enraged about it? So that's just kind of my personal opinion. And Ryan, what is your opinion <coughs> on the, the situation? Well, I, I'm kind of torn about it. I mean, I'm, I'm a traditionalist, so I would prefer to see the stores being closed on Thanksgiving. However, from another point of view, I mean, I guess you could say um, that w what we have been seeing is, you know, more and more, you know, Christmas, Christmas is getting more commercialized. So it's always trying to get it early, get the early shoppers and the money early on. Uh, and I can still remember, you know, and it still happens, although I feel like it's not as much. We're seeing all the things going on with, you know, Black Friday and people like standing in front and then like charging through and sadly, you know, barreling down uh, workers at these stores with some getting injured or killed. And that's simply just not acceptable. Um, so I think in, in one sense, opening on Thanksgiving kind of relieves the uh, intense pressure for stores on Black Friday because then it's more of like a gradual wave coming in, which I think is better for the safety of the employees. However, being the traditionalist person that I am, I think that it should be a day that where people can, you know, should have time with their families. Um, but yeah, on the flip side, I see the needs of the stores and especially you know, some of the workers at these stores, they might need that paycheck. Uh, by having the store open on Thanksgiving. So I think, you know, if, if you don't agree with it, you don't have to shop at those stores. If you do, then you can go. You make some very good points there. And uh, looking at some statistics here, 45% of people plan on shopping uh, on Thanksgiving, but six in 10 Americans say that they, uh, they hate stores that are open on Thanksgiving, and 12% that they say that they like or, uh, or love the practice. Um, but going from those statistics, and you see stores like Toys R Us that are opening at 5 p.m., and like uh, Kohl's and Sears and Macy's are going to open at 6, 6 p.m. on that day. Kmart's opening at 6 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day. So, and then you have Walmart, who is open 24-7. So um, if you were a business, if you were a business owner, uh, would you keep your store open all, like all day or half of the day uh, on Thanksgiving? Uh, Paige, your opinion? Well, this, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. Um, if I owned a business, no, I would not keep my store open. Um, I work for the, the TJX Corporation. I work at TJ Maxx. And TJ Maxx has just taken the stance that Thanksgiving is a family day. Um, they, they do advertise that to an extent, but I don't think many people know that they do that intentionally. As an employee, I'm aware of this. My managers make, made it known to me. But I really appreciate that. They took a stance, they ran with it, and we are open on Black Friday, but it is not, we don't have any sales. So it's just a normal day for us. So um, I really appreciate the way that the, that corporation has chose to do things. And if I owned a business, I would follow um, a similar suit. Uh, because I do think in some sense that businesses try to either put each other down or compete as far as being open or not being open. Like um, TJ Maxx could really get fierce with these other stores who are open, their competitors, to try to get those people who are traditionalists to say, look at the values of this store. I'm going to shop here for the rest of the year. And to some degree, that is a good strategy. And there are people who will intentionally avoid certain stores who do commercialize things to the degree that things become these days. But um, I'm not sure that effect has been a great enough incentive for stores to say, I'm not going to be open to avoid this bad portrayal and persona of missing out on tradition and missing out on family because not many people think that deeply, unfortunately. You will, you will have that. Um, Ryan, your opinion on uh, would you keep your business open on Thanksgiving Day to make more profit into Black Friday as well? Well, just to quickly kind of bounce off what, what Paige just had said, uh, I would have to also say that, you know, if, people, if that's something people are really upset about, they won't shop at those stores. I mean, there's still a movement that exists of people who say, um, you know, I'm not going to shop at places that don't say Merry Christmas. Uh, so I think, you know, in also a similar way, you know, people do that with family values and uh, tie into what your question was. Chick-fil-A, I think, is a perfect example of this. You know, they are closed every single Sunday because that's the values that Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, had for his company. 
And I can't tell you, I'm, I'm sure we've all done it at some point, you know, we forget they're closed on Sunday. We drive, we're like, oh, I can't believe they're closed. So, I mean, it's, it's an inconvenience to us, but I'm sure if I was an employee of Chick-fil-A, I would enjoy having that day off, spending time with my family, going to church, or even just, you know, doing things around the house that need to get done. So if I was running a family, I would definitely have to say that I would keep my store closed on Thanksgiving, um, but that would be, you know, my store. But, you know, as, as uh, Paige said earlier, I think it also really depends on, um, you know, what your values are as a company or as a person. And I think, you know, for the most part, your store kind of reflects that. Yeah, and it's, it's true. It depends on if it's a big business as well. It seems like these smaller ones are the ones that aren't really, uh, that are, excuse me, uh, the ones who think a little bit more about what people, what their employees are dealing with. And like, obviously Thanksgiving's not like as big as Christmas, Correct. but we do get off school um, mm -hmm. for a whole week for Thanksgiving. So it is a pretty important time to spend with your family. It's a traditional American thing. Um, but yeah, then you'll see like Walmart open 24 seven. It's a huge business and it, it just seems like they don't think about it as much. And usually the people at their stores don't uh, you know, need the money for those days. Like you said, you made a good point about uh, that they might need the money for the spending the next day on Black Friday. Uh, but uh, coming up after the break, an 81-year-old woman fulfills her dream of becoming a Girl Scout and a Florida pastor breaks a Guinness World Record. Stay tuned. For our final segment, we want you to take a look at this. An 81-year-old woman's dream of becoming a Girl Scout has finally come true. Rebecca Ray has the story. A reaction eight decades in the making. Marilyn Black's entire life, she wanted to be a Girl Scout. We were poor, we couldn't afford uh, the fee. For Marilyn's 81st birthday, her sister gave a priceless gift. She contacted Girl Scouts of America asking for a used uniform. Instead, the troop accepted her as their own. To be a Girl Scout, you have to live by the Girl Scout promise and law. And really, that's just about being a good human being. Everyone around her will vouch she's met those requirements. Decades after she first yearned for that fellowship, Marilyn is a daisy. When her sister and I sat down to, to look at all the requirements of being a daisy, all the things that they can achieve, we realized that Marilyn had already achieved almost all of those. All but one. Marilyn still had to be a sister to every Girl Scout. This is going to be the best troop ever. And within seconds of receiving her cap and vest, she earned that final pedal. We share stuff, don't we? Like if I want your pen, you give it to me. <laughs> now we won't have to hear about her not being a Girl Scout when she was little and poor. She may be the oldest Daisy ever inducted to a troop, but she has just as much spunk as any of her new sisters. I'm proud to be one. I mean, who gets to be 81 and gets to be a Girl Scout? A Daisy proving you're never too old to dream. Anything is possible. Now listen to this. For a pretty long time, a Florida pastor gave the longest speech ever and earned a world record, preaching for 50 hours while also serving a good cause. Kalorama has the story. Here we go. Three, two, one. We did it, right? Amen. It can now be called the longest speech ever by the Guinness Book of World Records. I'm actually not near as tired as I thought I'd be. Reverend Zach Zender of the Cross Church in Mount Dora hasn't slept in 50 hours. He began his journey at 7 a.m. Friday. My goal was to preach uh, the entire Bible. But Guinness rule stated he couldn't have a copy of the Bible with him, and he could only have a five-minute break every hour. Did you ever think you'd join a church that would set out a goal like this? No, I did not. And I'm an old lady, I'm 65, and this is the most upbeat place. 
And with his Sunday sermon, he completed 50 sermons. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came. Not only did the pastor break a Guinness Book of World Records, he exceeded his own goal of going past 50 hours of preaching straight. He's also raising money for a great cause. The Powerhouse Recovery Home is for men looking for help breaking addictions like Brandon Bradshaw. I mean, I'm one of the first uh, residents, so I'm blessed. Uh, God brought me here for a reason. People sitting in on the longest speech this weekend pledged money to Hand in Hand in Eustis, which runs the home. David Douglas is the executive director and told us they've raised nearly $100,000. For every dollar that's given towards addiction recovery, it saves the community $12. So if we can raise this $100,000, that will actually save our community $1.2 million. And the pastor's next goal? Do you plan on sleeping for a while after this? I hope so. <laughs> In Mount Dora, Calorama, Local 6. Thank you so much. Good luck with the rest. Thank you for joining us again on this episode of The Waynesburg Effect. We'll see you next time.